Hello brothers and sisters! Good afternoon from this side of the world and welcome to our Feast at Home here in North America which is one of the happiest virtual places here on earth. I am Sister Joss Liano and I'm currently serving here at the Feast in Los Angeles. I have a question for all of you brothers and sisters. How many of you have this wishful thinking? How I wish I were a child again. Can you type in on the comment box below? Yes, I know that sometimes you wish you could go back to your childhood stage. Because based on our experience and based on what we see in children, um, they seem to have a very free life and uh, they seem to be happy. If not all the time, but in most cases. And like us, adults, we seem to be dealing with never-ending challenges complex and complicated ones and at the same time we also have to deal with different kinds of people from various backgrounds and profiles so in relation to what i said i would like to share with you a story can i of course you don't have a choice so anyway my story goes this way there's this acrobat cyclist who has been making uh, guinness world records and at one point, he told to himself, I'm about to retire and I want to make a record that no one could ever break in the entire history of humankind. So what he did is that he set up a rope at, uh, at 50,000 cliff with a 100 kilometer distance. So before he began his performance, he asked the crowd, do you think that I'll be able to pass through this rope? And everybody in the crowd was cheering on him, yes, you can do it. And so he did. And so when he reached the other side of the rope, he removed one of the cycles. And he asked again the audience, do you think that I'll be able to do it? Yes, of course, you will be able to do it. And so he did. For his, uh, for his final performance, um, he asked the crowd, do you think that I'll be able to go back to the other side of the room while holding a person? And everybody on the crowd, wow, that's fantastic. Of course you can do it. You're amazing. And so he asked the crowd, can I have a volunteer, please? And everybody was silent, except for a child who raised his hand and said, I volunteer. I want to feel you know, I want to experience how it feels like to be there. And so, of course, we know the end of the story. The cyclist and the child were able to pass through the rope. And towards the end, the media approached the child and asked him, Why did you do that? Didn't you realize that it was too dangerous? The child smiled and responded, Of course I know. I knew it would be too risky and dangerous. But I believe that that cyclist would never ever let me go and would not let something bad happen to me because he is my father. I know brothers and sisters that there are so many thoughts now in your head and uh, I think one of those is that sometimes we can relate with the people in the crowd that we tend not to exercise a childlike faith. So as we continue with our session, I would like to invite you to join me in worshiping the Lord. And um, I have chosen this song, Oceans by Hillsong, because for me, it resonates in my spiritual life and it has relations with the story that I, sh I just shared with you. And I think uh, for this session, the Lord is reminding us to exercise a childlike faith, which has for me has five characteristics as follows. Number one, we have to be curious about who God is and His will for us. Number two, we have to be courageous in our daily dealings, knowing that the Lord will always grant us strength and wisdom. Number three, we have to be confident in God's love, knowing that He is always faithful and constant in His love for us. Number four and five, we have to be cooperative and compliant in His will for us by abiding in His presence, by abiding in His teachings. So brothers and sisters, let us now worship the Lord. You call 
and sisters, I hope and pray that God has been revealing his message to you through this series. If you're ready, let's offer our declaration to God with great conviction. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word so that I become more like Jesus every day. Today, I proclaim that I'm God's beloved, I'm God's servant, I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I'm blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible with you or Bible app on your phone, let's bookmark it to Matthew 18 and let's sing. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light 
and to my path. Today, I want to preach the message, throw away the ladder. One might wonder, is there really a ladder in God's kingdom? It's pretty obvious that there's a ladder in the kingdom of this world, unless you've been living under a rock. You know, there's a very intense hierarchy around you. Some are rich, some are poor, some are powerful, some are powerless. That's why you hear the message, aim for number one, aspire for the top, climb to the corporate ladder. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus came into this world to shake things up. If you've noticed, in many accounts of the Bible, Jesus came to build a kingdom with no letters, where everyone had equal worth. All of us are the same, regardless of your profession, status in life, or color. He did it in two ways. First, Jesus treated the bottom dwellers as his VIPs. If you've noticed, the Beatitudes contains Jesus' VIP guest list for his kingdom party. He treated all the rejects of the society, the poor, the lepers, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, as beautiful human beings, the downcast. He treated them as his friends. He ate with them, laughed with them, and loved each one with great dignity and respect. He treated them as his God containers. Even his choice of disciples, he picked 12 outsiders nobody would have chosen. That's why the people on top, the religious leaders, didn't like what Jesus was doing because he was disregarding the hierarchy that was maintaining their power and privileges. Second, Jesus went down to the bottom of the ladder. Like most of us today, everyone wants to go up, but Jesus went down. He dove downward when God became a fetus in a young girl's belly. The greatest scandal of the universe, the Almighty God walked among us. And when Jesus became human, he didn't stop there. He always find ways to reach out to those who are at the bottom. In ancient times, the hierarchy of the Jewish society is like this. On top were the Roman conquerors of the day. Second were the puppet leaders like Herod. Third were the chief priests, Sadducees, and below them were the Pharisees, as well as anyone who had influence and money. Fourth were the small entrepreneurs, like the traders, carpenters, like Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, and fishermen like Peter, James, and John. At the bottom were the throwaways of the society, the poor, the lame, the blind, an adulterous woman that the Pharisees wanted to stone to death, plus the Samaritan woman who had five husbands. And there were the tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew, and of course, the lepers, who everyone avoided. And at the bottom, the criminals, who were humiliated in public and crucified on dirty crosses. That's where Jesus went. He went to the very bottom. In the same way, Jesus is telling us to treat everyone with respect. He's telling you and me, it's okay to be weak. It's okay to show our failures. You don't have to wear a mask. I am willing to accept you for who you are, even if you are at the end of the line. Jesus knows you and me, and he knows how to feel what is lacking in our heart. He is asking us to share his love to everyone. Brother Dan will dive into our Bible passage today. Brother Dan. Let me start with asking you a question. Brothers and sisters, where is the kingdom of heaven? Feel free to type it down below. Some may point to the skies or the vast universe. Some may say that the kingdom of heaven is found in nature. Some may say that the heaven 
is found in holy places such as their favorite shrines or church around the world. But the best answer I've ever encountered came from a man named Steve. He said that he believes that heaven is anywhere God is present. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 18, 20, in 18, 20, that for where there are two or three gathered in his name, that he is there in the midst of them? So if the kingdom of heaven is anywhere God is present, and if there are two or more people gathered in his name, then the feast is not only the happiest place on earth, but the happiest place in the whole universe. Because in the midst of us is God. And in every feast, we are participating in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Good afternoon. My name is Brother Daniel Rodriguez, District Builder for Inland Empire, California. Please join me in thanking Brother Aldrin for yet another great talk. I hope you and your family are staying cool and blessed down there in Texas. Thank you. Now back to our scriptures. Notice that every single story we've read so far, we're building up to where we are now. In the 18th chapter of Matthew, verse 1. Say this out loud with me, please. The disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? The original word used for kingdom was more of a verb than a noun. Brother Bo said it best, and quote, the kingdom was more an action than a place. When God reigns, that's the kingdom. Another favorite preacher of mine, one of my favorite pastors as well, Pastor Rick Warren, also said it best, quote, the kingdom of God is God's people doing God's purposes on God's planet. That's it. It's not a place. It's not a thing. It's God's people doing God's purposes on God's planet. My siblings in Christ, can I ask you another question? Are you doing God's purpose on God's planet? If the answer is yes, then you are living in the kingdom of heaven. But who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Why did the disciples ask this question? Maybe they were thinking, if Jesus was going to become a king, take back Israel from the Romans and rule over it, who was going to be his right-hand man? Who was going to be in his inner circle? His vice president, his secretary of defense, his secretary of state, his treasurer. Well, 2,000 years later, nothing much has changed. We live in a world where everything should be about me. For example, we take from nature more than we need. We don't even leave some behind for the next person, whether it's hunting, fishing, or buying canned goods or tissue during the pandemic. Take, 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 I, 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 me, 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 me oh my, no wonder so many people are miserable. If your motto is everything's about me, you'll be living alone in your own little universe. We want to be the greatest employee, we want to be the greatest politicians, the greatest entrepreneur, the greatest actress, the greatest actor, the greatest cook, the greatest parent, the greatest this, the greatest that. You know, this type of aspiration has been affecting the church for the past 2,000 years. Which religion is the greatest? Which feast is the greatest? Who is the greatest preacher, the greatest musician, the greatest worship leader? But let's not forget who first asked the question, who is the greatest? In the kingdom of heaven it was the apostles and how did Jesus respond Jesus called the little child to him 
and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, for the longest time, I thought Jesus was referring to childlike faith in order for a person to enter the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus wants us to mimic specific characteristics of children. But Jesus was not talking about a child's personality, but rather a child's powerlessness. Remember, it was very different in the ancient Jewish society. A child was powerless. Positionally, they were at the bottom of society's ladder. So Jesus was not talking about the child's traits, but the child's status in society in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember, the disciples' question was about position. Who is the greatest? Can I be the greatest? Can I be on top of the ladder? So to paraphrase Jesus, he was basically saying, saying hey guys, by asking that question, who is the greatest, you are joining the wrong kingdom. Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, isn't a race to the top, but a race to the bottom. I mean, what did Jesus do while he was here on earth? He shared the good news, trained leaders, helped the poor, taught the children, and cared for the sick. So how do you know if you're part of the kingdom? Check your purpose. Check your why. Check your center. And if Jesus is not in the center, and if everything's still about me, then God is not ruling in your life. You know, Jesus concluded by saying that anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. My brother in Christ, my sister in Christ, how do you treat the poor, the oppressed, the depressed? How do you treat your annoying co-worker? Annoying co-worker that you have to spend eight hours a day and five days a week with. What about your loving in-law? How do you treat the homeless? How do you treat someone you do not agree with politically? How about someone who has different gender preference? How do you treat people who have wronged you, hurt you, backstabbed you? In God's eyes, they are all his children. And in God's eyes, they are all your siblings. If you want to follow Jesus, if you really follow Jesus, if you think you're following Jesus, then there should be no ladder in your heart. You know, all my life, I've tried to throw away the inner ladder over and over and over again. And yet over and over and over again, I have failed many times. I know I have a long way to go. I'm a work in progress. And I know there's just so much more that I can do. And so daily through meditation and prayer, I keep asking God for the grace to help me throw away that inner ladder in my heart. That's why God has blessed me to be surrounded by community of men and women who affirms me and like me continually strives to become the best version of ourselves despite falling over and over and over again you know one afternoon in a basketball league i was playing in years ago a friend came up to me right before a game and from afar i could already see the disappointment in his face as he walked towards me to make the long story short what had happened was that he and his girlfriend back then they are married now went to confession at that time they were both separated or divorced from their ex-husband and ex-wife and one day my 
you know, my friend just decided to take his girlfriend to confession so she could unload all the negative feelings and hurt she was carrying around. And of course, to ask for God's forgiveness. Unfortunately, midway to the confession, finding out about her marital situation, the priest, unfortunately, immediately denied her a confession. So let me close and wrap up this story with a tale. One day, a man was traveling on the road, and because it was getting dark, he fell into a pit. It was so deep, he couldn't get out. So he began to cry out for help. Speaking of a priest, a priest passed by and saw him in the pit, and he said, You fell because you are careless. You deserve to be in that pit. And the priest walked away. Then a pastor passed by and saw the guy in the pit. He said, if you only listen to me, you will not be in this pit. And he walked away. A preacher passed by and saw the man in the pit. And he said, if you'll get out of the pit, I'll teach you how not to fall in the pit again. And he walked away. Many other people, such as worship leaders, youth pastors, youth ministers, saw this man but did nothing. But then Jesus walked by, and without saying a word, he jumped into the bottom of the pit and pushed this man out of the pit. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He took the lowest place so that he could push us out of the bottom and whatever bottom you're going through right now, Jesus is here. Jesus is with you in your bottom. Whether it's the pit of depression, sickness, loss of a loved one, pit of unforgiveness, financial pitfall, divorce, pit of pride, whatever it is, He is with you in your bottom. And when you get out of that pit, He will give you a purpose. As a matter of fact, He will give you a purpose to get out of that pit. And speaking of pit, I was in a pit myself not too long ago. And as many of you already know, I had an accident where a pickup truck struck me while I was cycling. Two weeks later, as if that wasn't enough, my wife suffered a miscarriage. For a moment, for a certain time, I thought maybe, just maybe, the God of love was punishing me. But looking back at it, it was through the pit of darkness where God's light shined the brightest. He took me out of that pit. And it was in that pit, the six months of recuperating, the six months of physical therapy, the six months of trying to get over the miscarriage. This six months and a half is where I found my purpose. I would not have discerned and volunteered to be the Inland Empire District Builder in California if it wasn't for my pit. I dropped out of work scholarship program and getting a master's degree, letting go of my aspirations of climbing the ladder by continuing my discernment to become a deacon one day. Brothers and sisters, in the kingdom of heaven, there's no such thing as punishment, only purpose. I repeat, in the kingdom of heaven, there's no such thing as punishment, only purpose. So throw away that ladder right here and right now. And remember, that the kingdom of God is measured in service. Amen. If this is a comfortable position for you, I ask that you raise an arm or two. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath as I lead you in prayer and to worship. Holy Father, we praise you, we glorify you, we give you thanks. Lord, 
Thank you for being my shepherd. Shepherd who rescues me like a sheep who falls into a pit. Thank you for being my shepherd, the one who leads my life. The shepherd, the one who stands on the hillsides where I can see you clearly, where I can see you from afar. And as a sheep, Lord God, I will look to you, listen to your voice, and follow your leading by first getting rid of the ladder in my heart. And even though I walk in the valley of shadow of death, darkness and evil, I will not fear, for you are with me. The King of Kings, the greatest of all kingdoms, the God of love, the God of mercy, the God of light, my Savior, my God, and my best friend. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let's put God in the center and worship Him as we sing this song. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a fortune came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
Thank you so much for subscribing and following Feast at Home. We don't want to end Feast at Home without saying a prayer for all of us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Thank you, loving Father God, for this message. Thank you, Lord, for your love. And thank you, Lord, for allowing yourself to go down into my level, to reach out to me, loving Father God, a sinner. Lord, bless these gifts. Bless our talents. Bless our skills, loving Father God. Allow us, Lord, to share the gifts that you've given us through others and allow us to bless others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you so much and hope to see you next week. Righteousness at Christ's expense. The grace of God is not generic. There is a dimension of grace. Grace is God choosing to bless us rather than curse us as our sin deserves. From Latin, price paid. Mercy is loving the unlovable and forgiving the unforgivable. So the grace of God gives you the ability to accept, to act, to appreciate and to adore Christ. Realizing that forgiveness is setting a prisoner free and discovering that that prisoner is me.